Hi everyone, Mrs. Hansen back here again, continuing our hard work in chapter two. We have been practicing electron arrangement around an atom and getting an idea about S-shaped clouds, P-shaped clouds, Ds and Fs, and all of the spatial orientations that give us insight into how electrons are arranged outside the nucleus of an atom. We're picking up in section six called an electron configuration. When I say electron configuration, it just simply means the unique arrangement of electrons around the, the nucleus of any atom. Remember that electrons have a unique number of electrons. Any atom has a unique number of electrons. I know that because every element has a unique atomic number. So elements have unique I'm going to catch that. Elements have unique numbers of electron elements. I can spell, talk, and write. <laughs> elements have unique numbers of electrons. And therefore, you'll see each one of our elements, each atom that represents a unique element, has a unique arrangement. When we refer to the ground state of an electron arrangement, it refers to the lowest energy arrangement possible. So all the electrons arranged around the nucleus of an atom are filling the lowest energy level possible. Let's review some general rules or guidelines, helpful hints as we start writing electron configurations of an atom. How do the electrons arrange themselves outside the nucleus? That's what I mean when I say a configuration. It's that arrangement of electrons. Well, rule number one says electrons are going to be placed in the lowest energy level first. So that means the lowest energy level is the energy level closest to the nucleus. And that, of course, would be the first energy level since the first energy level only has one sublevel, the first two electrons for any atom will always get placed into the 1s orbital. So when I see a designation of 1s with a superscript of 2, I know that this tells me the first, in, uh, first principal energy level, n equal 1 that the principal energy level is telling me what period the energy relies in, period one, period two. So principal energy level, n equal one, the lowest energy level possible. And when I see the S of this designation, S is telling me the shape of the cloud. This is known as the subshell. S are spherical, P look like hourglasses, Ds look like clover leaves, and so forth. The shape are designated with letters, S, P, D, and F. Those are called subshells. And that superscript that I see tells me the number of electrons. So rule number one says orbitals will always begin, electrons will always begin filling orbitals with the lowest energy possible. And then we proceed by filling orbitals that are the next highest level and then the next highest level. So we fill them in order of increasing energy, lowest energy level first. Each orbital holds a maximum of two electrons, rule number two. And I want us to kind of go through there and mention they must be of opposite spin. Opposite spin helps alleviate repulsive forces of those like charged electrons. And rule three, when orbitals hold two electrons of opposite spin, we start looking at entering orbitals of equal energy. Equal energy has a vocabulary word called degenerate. Degenerate means of equal energy. We place an electron into one orbital first before going back and assigning partners. Let me clarify. A moment ago, we said that an S-shaped cloud has just one spatial orientation. It's like a sphere on an X, Y, Z axis. No matter which way I spin a sphere, it looks the same no matter what. So one shape to an S-shaped orbital. 
The second energy level also has an S-shaped cloud, but it also has three different spatial orientations for a P-shaped cloud. We called those P sub X, P sub Y, P sub Z. Since there are three shapes to those clouds, they are of equal energy. That tells me that a 2 sub P X, 2 P Y, 2 P Z, they're all the same energy. All that means is that one of them is twisted on the X axis around the nucleus, which is right here. Here's the P sub Y, here's the nucleus, here's the P sub Z, still the nucleus in the center there. They are all of equal energy. I'm going to place an electron, let me, let me represent the electrons by an arrow. The electron is just gonna be represented by an arrow. I'm going to place those electrons one into each orbital first, all spinning the same way. Then I can go back and put four, five, six, spinning the opposite way. At most, an orbital can hold only two electrons. We wrote that several times on the previous slide. Each one of my boxes is going to represent an orbital, kind of a shorthand instead of drawing all those shapes of the clouds. Let's just call that a box. An orbital diagram is what we're starting to draw here. The X, Y, and Z shaped orbitals of the P cloud have three equal energy orbitals. So I must place one into each first, spinning the same way. Then if I have more to place, I go back, put electron four, then five, then six, partnering up after each has received one. Now I put on your paper, it matches here, what I refer to as really just kind of a cheat sheet, a nice helpful way of writing electron configurations. Notice that the boxes here are representing orbitals. And each orbital can hold up to two electrons. An S-shaped cloud, the lowest energy level first, always receives the first two electrons. So the lowest energy level must be given the first two electrons. And then I start really just filling electrons, looking at this orbital diagram to help me achieve the lowest possible configuration. The first two electrons, if I let electrons being represented by little arrows, let's, let's do this. Hydrogen has one electron. Hydrogen is number one on the periodic table, has one electron. That first electron would get placed as an arrow. I could point it up or down, it doesn't matter. In the first shell, there is a subshell with an S-shaped spherical orbital, and there's one electron inside of it. What if I wanted to draw helium? Helium has two electrons. The first of the two electrons gets placed in the 1s orbital, just like hydrogen, but now I have a second one to place, and I'm going to put it into the 1s orbital, spinning down so that we alleviate repulsive forces. One spins up, one spins down. The electron configuration for hydrogen, 1s1. The electron configuration for helium, 1s2, two electrons in that 1s subshell. Notice now that's full. So if I go to my third element on the periodic table, which is lithium number three, how would it arrange its three electrons around the periodic table, around that nucleus? Well again, three electrons. The first two must always start at the bottom of our grid here, filling the 1s orbital. Two electrons complete that orbital, so the first two of the three, 1s2. But I have one more to place. That means I'm going to follow the arrow up, and the next sublevel I fill is the 2s orbital. So the next electron for a total of three is 1s2, 2s1. The superscripts add to three. Those superscripts tell me there's three electrons there. 
How about next door? From lithium, we travel to beryllium, number four. The first two fill the 1S sublevel. Then it's full. Now, right now I have just three, so I have lithium. If I add one more, I can get the fourth electron completing, oops, I forgot my S, completing the S sublevel of the second energy level. So the electron configuration for beryllium, who's number four, 1S2, 2S2. The superscripts represent the elemental arrangement found inside of those orbitals. I want to try another. Next door to beryllium lives boron. Boron is number five. It has five electrons to place. It gets redundant because we always start at the lowest energy level first, 1s2. We then move to the next lowest energy level, which is the 2s sublevel, and fill it. So 2s2. We have one more to add because beryllium has a fifth electron. Where do we put it? We put it in the next highest energy level in the 2p sublevel. Boron is 2p1. That adds to five valence electrons. Keep going with me. Write these on your paper with me. If, I, if you haven't yet, we're doing this together. Here we're writing for the next element, which would be carbon. Carbon is number six on the periodic table, so we have six electrons to write for. We always start with the lowest energy and fill them before we move to the next. So, so far, 1s2, 2s2, and I have one sitting there in the p orbital from boron. To get a next, I have to place it in the next orbital that gives me a total of two in that P sublevel. The orbital diagram I am filling with this grid and I'm writing the electron configuration on this margin side here. The orbital diagram uses this grid the electron configuration is where you start seeing 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Let's go down to the next one, which would be nitrogen, which is number seven. So we have seven electrons to fill. On our grid, we already have six from our previous example, carbon, two in the s, two more in the next s, two more in the p. Where will that third one go? We need the number of electrons to add to seven. That third electron in the P sublevel goes into the next blank orbital, all spinning the same way. Now what's interesting, when we get to oxygen, who's number eight, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, four electrons, now get me to the eight electrons I need, this is finally where I can add a second electron into any of these orbitals. I'm going to go back and give a partner. Notice it's spinning in the opposite direction. The superscripts add to eight, representing the electron arrangement, which we call the electron configuration for the element oxygen. Complete the row with me. Fluorine is number nine. It has nine valence electrons. Its configuration is going to match that of oxygen plus one more in the p orbital. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p, and now we need one more in there to get us to nine total. So now I have five in the p orbital. Adding one more into the p orbital, I place it into the next empty orbital that needs a partner. And finally, finishing row two, we get to neon. Neon is number 10 on the periodic table. 10 electrons to place. We already have nine placed so far from writing fluorine. We need to find the place to add the 10th electron. That's 1s2, 2s2, 2p. Add one more in there to get six to give us a total of 10. This arrow represents the 10th electron and that is the electron configuration for neon. 
Notice that finished the second energy level. And so if we go through and keep going, I mean, this is just redundant, right? You just pick an element and keep filling in this grid, follow the arrows filling in the grid, and you are writing the electron configuration and the orbital diagram for any element. If we were to continue this and go to sodium, who's number 11, we start out always, always the same way. 1s2, it's full. 2s2, then it's full. 2p6, it's full. So we need a next energy level. Follow that arrow and where do we go? Well, we hit the 3s sublevel. I place my 11th electron in the 3s orbital, giving us the electron configuration for sodium number 11. Notice that the superscripts tell us the number of electrons in each sublevel. There are two electrons in the s sublevel of the first energy level, 1s2. The next two electrons are placed in the second energy level in the s sublevel, 2s2. The next six electrons get placed in the 2p sublevel, then it's full. If we have a next electron a place, which sodium does, you place that in the 3s. If I had to keep going, magnesium, which would have 12, I add it here and I just simply keep going, matching the number of electrons into the number of orbitals. Notice here in the D, there's five degenerate orbitals of equal energy before I go back and assign partners. Now this is a wonderful tool and it will be provided on your uh, tests, your quizzes, your exams. It's part of your test taking tool pages. There is a little uh, simplified version. If you're, if you're working on homework and don't have this piece of paper, I want you to know that it's really easy to duplicate. And it's the electron pyramid is what I referred to. Draw this with me and I'm gonna start down low because of lowest energy. I like to think of that lowest energy levels down here. So the first energy level has one sublevel, an S. A second energy level has two sublevels, the S and P. So write that exactly as I'm showing. The third energy level has three sublevels, an S, a P, and a D. The fourth energy level has four sublevels. The S, the P, the D, and the F. Now, what about those numbers? I know that regardless of what energy level, S orbitals only hold two electrons. Then it's full. I know because P's have three different degenerate orbitals, three orbitals that are of equal energy, each one holds up to two electrons. At maximum, P's can hold six electrons. I know that D's have five degenerate orbitals, five shapes. Each one of those shapes holds two electrons to give me 10 maximum. And the F's have seven different degenerate orbitals each orbital holds two electrons for a maximum of 14. Now notice N are the whole numbers. N equal one, period one. N equal two, period two, three, four. So there are greater than four periods. There's a 5S, 6S, 7S. That's row seven. Those are getting to be really big atoms. So we have a 5P, a 6P, a 7P. I'm just letting you know that the grid continues. It's just that you get really big atoms by the time you get to those particular numbers. But I'll complete this just so you can see. S's, regardless of what quantum number they're in, seven, six, five, S's always hold two. P's always hold up to six in their three different orbitals and so forth. Now this is the trick. 
This helps me find how to arrange electrons as I fill the grid. I start at the bottom with the lowest energy level here. And I want you to follow the arrows I'm about to draw. The lowest energy level gets filled first, 1s2. I've hit the end of the row, so I come back. I then fill 2s2. I hit the end of the row, and I come back. From 2s2, I fill 2p6, 3s2, I hit the end of the row, and I come back. From 3s2, I hit 3p6, 4s2, end of the row, I come back. Now this is the critical. 3d fills before 4p, fills before 5s. 4d, 5p, 6s. 4F, 5D, 6S, 7S. So that's telling me the order in which to fill, follow the arrows. On this grid, notice that after 4S, we filled the 3D. We fill the 4S before you fill the 3D. You fill the 4S, end of the row, then come back and you hit 3D. So this arrow diagram, the pyramids, help you figure out very quickly without necessarily being provided that tool page. You can create your own, it's very simple to do, and then follow the arrows and you're on your own trying to fill out electron configurations. So I wanted to share that little trick just to make sure we see there are, there are multiple tool pages available to help us remember how to fill in electrons to complete electron configurations. We use those orbital diagrams. Now this text uses a box. An orbital diagram will use a box to represent an orbital. Orbitals hold at most two electrons and those electrons are going to be uh, represented by arrows and the arrows will point up or point down to represent a pair spinning in opposite direction. If you see a single arrow, it is an unpaired electron. If you see an arrow with one up, one down in the box, it's a pair of electrons and those paired spins must be opposite. So always be sure to place opposite spins in the same box. The other thing I wanna emphasize, if you are filling orbitals of equal energy, if this represents 2px, 2py, 2pz, place one into each orbital first, all spinning the same way before you assign the partners if needed. So this particular diagram I placed here, you have a copy. Also with the help of the periodic table, you'll be able to write any electron configuration and its orbital diagram. These two tool pages are provided for you on any test. They're provided for you as tool pages in your uh, exams and your quizzes, and you have them hard copy in front of you right now. Should we practice some? They're not hard at all. Let's write the electron configuration, we've done some already, for the electrons in the following elements. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, carbon, neon. Now in our discussion earlier, I've done all of those for you. I recommend pausing the video without peeking back, without peeking, see if you can rewrite the orbital diagrams and configurations for each of these elements. Come back to me when you're ready to check. All right, well, let's begin. Hydrogen number one, oh my gosh, we can't get any easier. Hydrogen has one electron, it's number one. So it, it has one electron in the S sublevel, and you would write that as a simple arrow in a box. Number two was helium. Helium has two electrons, it's number two on the periodic table. Both of those electrons go into the same orbital, 1s2 has one arrow spinning up, one arrow spinning down. Lithium is number three. 
So this time we have a 1s2, 2s1. The first two electrons get placed in the 1s orbital. The third electron gets placed in the 2s orbital. Then we're done, three electrons. We're gonna skip to lithium, we go to carbon, which is now six electrons. The first two electrons get placed in the 1s orbital, two electrons at max, and then it's full. The next two electrons get placed in the 2s orbital, then it's full. Right, so I'm just kind of rewriting. I should put these little arrows. They're gonna be kind of messy, but we'll deal with that. That's four. We need a total of six. So in the next orbital, which would be 2p, the p-shaped orbitals have three different orientations. So notice what I did there, a little shortcut. There's my px, py, pz. I have two orbitals, or I'm sorry, two electrons to place so I'll have one empty orbital altogether and two unpaired, both spinning up. They could both be spinning down, it does not matter. And of course the last one was neon, who is number 10 total electrons. Neon will have 1s2, the first of the 10 electrons, 2s2, the next two electrons, we're at four, we need 10. So now we have two P. P's have three different spatial orientations. We're at four, so here's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Six more in the P gave us ten altogether, so we can complete that by filling the second energy level. We've written for hydrogen, helium, lithium, Boron, whoops, I'm sorry, I skipped boron. We went directly to carbon. Carbon is at the end. 1s2, 2s2, 2p2 was carbon. And finally here, we had the end of row two, which was neon. They're really not that tough, are they? They're actually kind of easy. Once you get the hang of that grid, you're all set. The electron configuration can be I think we did these, these are the answers. Let me scroll ahead. There we go. The electron configuration can be shortened by using a noble gas configuration. The noble gas notation you're gonna fall in love with once you figure out how to use this because it takes that redundancy of uh, writing always, always, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, all of that redundancy and it shortens it up for us. It does so by allowing us to find the previous noble gas we passed through. Remember a noble gas is where we found group 8a. The noble gas is the very last column on the far right side. Once we do that, and just to kind of help you, it's the last P6 orbital you filled. Now remember, if it's row two, it might be a uh, helium was the last noble gas, which would have been a 1s2. That's a noble gas that represents helium. So if it's a very small atom, 1s2 represents helium. Uh, the last thing for the next noble gas would be neon. Neon, we filled 2p6. Uh, 3p6 would have filled uh, argon. End of row three is the noble gas argon. But you're looking to find the last noble gas, that configuration, and then just simply pick up with the valence electrons. I'll throw that word out. Anything past, anything past the noble gas configuration are going to be referred at as the outermost energy levels known as the valence electrons. So here we just wrote for the element carbon, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Notice that the sum of the superscripts is six electrons, carbon is number six, so I know it had six electrons. I can identify the element just by counting up the superscripts there to get the identity. The last noble gas we actually passed through was helium. Now visually, let me represent that. If carbon lives here, to get to carbon, we pass through hydrogen, helium, 
lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, we arrived, right? So that's the journey. We started up at hydrogen, just keep adding one more electron. The last noble gas you passed through was helium. Its electron configuration is 1s2. So when I put in a bracket, the noble gas configuration of helium, when I place it in a bracket, that's representing its configuration of 1s2. So I'm allowed to write helium 2s2, 2p2. Now I gotta confess, I'm not saving much time by placing helium in a bracket and putting 1s2 there. I mean, either one of them pretty much has the same number of keystrokes, right? But as atoms get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, it's gonna be an incredible time saver to place a noble gas in a, in a bracket and just pick up afterwards with the next s orbital. Let's convince you of that. Let's write the complete configuration and then the noble gas notation for the element calcium. When you find calcium on the periodic table, its elemental symbol is Ca. It is in period four, it is in group 2A. Now that should be all necessary to tell you where to find it. Calcium is number 20. You find it? So just looking at a quick periodic table, find number 20 and you see calcium. Fourth row tells me that I'm gonna have four valence, uh, four shells, N equal four. And group 2A, second column there, group 2A is gonna tell me I'm gonna have two valence electrons. That's why it lives where it lives. Period four, four shells. Group 2A, two valence electrons. Let's write them. First two electrons always fill the lowest energy level first. There's the 1s2 orbital. Once the 1s2 orbital is filled, we go to the next highest energy level, which is the 2s orbital. It can hold up to two more electrons. We're at four so far. From 2s, we know we're going to fill the p's. I know that p's have three different degenerate, means of equal energy, orbitals. We call those px, py, pz. Each one of these orbitals holds two electrons. There's the 2p6. Right now, I'm standing at neon. I'm standing at neon means I've written 10 electrons. I gotta go further, because I gotta write 20. Right now, are you following your, your um, pyramid page? This grid is going to help you, right? Just that provided tool page. If you have that in front of you, you're just following in. We have to fill 20 electrons. So I keep going until all 20 are filled. Here's the first two. Let me make that cleaner. Yeah, I need 20. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, all spinning the same way. The next three bring me to 18, and there will be 19, 20. So that's how I know quickly to fill the grid. And that's going to just be practice. 2P6, so I'm standing at neon. Neon's row is full. I go down to the third energy level. Third energy level starts with the 3S2, two more electrons. Two, oops, from the 3s, we go to the 3p, and there'll be six orbitals, or six electrons and three orbitals. All spinning the same way, go back and assign a partner. Remember that little cheat sheet? It's so easy to regenerate, I find it far more helpful than the other sheet, but you decide. First two electrons, 1s2. The next two electrons, 2s2. The next electrons, 2p6, 3s2. Right now, 10, 11, 12, 18. We're at 18 electrons so far. Who's number 18? That's argon. 
I go down a row. I got to get through potassium and then calcium yet. I got to have once um, the 3S2 is filled, where do we go next? We go into the 4S2, which I didn't draw from 3P. We go into 4S2. Now I can see where to land. Remember, I count up from 3P. We go into 4S2. That gives us 20 electrons for calcium. We've just written 20 electrons in terms of the orbital diagram. What was the last P6 orbital we filled? The last noble gas we filled was the 3P6, who represents the element with 18 electrons, that's argon. So the complete configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, that adds to 20. When I place in a bracket argon, that represents all of these core electrons. Those electrons that are not available for bonding or reacting, they're shut down when they reach that last electron configuration of a noble gas. That represents 18 electrons of argon. We need two more to get to calcium. So there's plus two more. The argon 4s2 represents the electron configuration using a noble gas shortcut. Argon 4s2 represents calcium in the noble gas configuration notation. Sometimes you hear it called the kernel method as well. See now what I mean, how it can be quite a nice shortcut. Each element is represented with an electronic configuration. Each element has a unique, remember, so each element is unique. Each element has a, a unique number of electrons, therefore a unique arrangement of those electrons. What element is being represented by each electron configuration? Friends, this is simple. It's, we can make it as simple as saying, remember that electron number is going to match the proton number, which is what we referred to as the atomic number, which gives the atom its identity. This can be as easy as adding the superscripts and then finding that number on the periodic table. Two plus two plus six so far is 10, that's this guy. Two plus two is four. I count 14 electrons in letter A, two, four, 10, 12, total of 14. Who is number 14 on the periodic table? Number 14 is the element called silicon with the elemental symbol Si. I'm gonna show you another, kind of thinking this through. What is the highest quantum number, the highest level of N that you see? I see right here, the third energy level is the highest energy level. That the number three is the highest number we wrote for the principal energy level. That's going to tell you period three. How many total electrons in the outermost energy level? There's two in the S and two more in the P. So the total number of valence electrons, and again, we're going to define this term, valence electrons, electrons in the highest energy level, the outermost energy level. There's a total of four. Two of them reside in the S, Two of them reside in the P sublevels, but two plus two still gives me four total valence electrons. This tells me the group 
number. The N tells me the period. The valence electrons tell me the group number. I can tell you the identity of the element instead of by counting superscripts, I can tell you that it's in period three, and I can tell you that it's in group 4A because it has four valence electrons. Who lives in period three, group 4A? Well, you got it, that's silicon. So you have a variety of ways of, of finding this answer. Count the number of total superscripts, and, and you'll have the identity. Let's model that again. We have one, two, three, four. Four plus six is 10. Now I'm at 12. Here I'm at 18, 19, 20, 21. Who is element number 21? Well, that's scandium. Elemental symbol, SC. Argon. Argon represents the first 18 electrons. Look at where argon lives. You see how it's number 18? So when I put AR in a bracket, that's giving me the number 18. Add two more and you get 20. Add 10 more and you get 30. There's 30 electrons represented with the noble gas configuration AR, 4S2, 3D10. Who's number 30? Well, that's zinc. So that's perhaps the, the sure-fired method. I just wanted to seed some more information there about periods and group numbers based on the configuration as well. Should we try a next? Well, now I'm looking at, uh, what, do we flip the page? Number 15 at the very top, what elements in the first and second period fit each description? So when I say first and second period, I mean n equal one and n equal two. The first and second period, the first period we know is only hydrogen helium. The second period contains lithium, beryllium, Boron carbon all the way through to the end of the row, neon, period one, period two. Letter A says the element has one electron in the second energy level. Well, that would represent one electron in the second energy level is a 2s1. Now let's think about hydrogen. It doesn't even have an electron in the second energy level, since it's only number one. Helium has only two electrons. It places them in the first energy level, in the S sublevel. It does not have any in the second energy level. It's only period one. And I get to period two, lithium, who's number three. The first two are placed in the S sublevel, the next is placed in the S of the second energy level, 2S1. Well, that's it right there, only one electron. Because if I go any further, beryllium, boron, carbon, if I go further in that row, I'm now completing the S sublevel. So this was representing lithium. There are two electrons in the 2S sublevel. Oh, we're almost there. Look at lithium. Next door to lithium lives beryllium, number four. Its first two are filling the S sublevel of energy level one. The next two, whoops, the next two will fill the second energy level's S sublevel. So two electrons in the 2S gives me the element beryllium. Who has the electron configuration? of 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. To know the identity, add the superscripts. Two plus two is four, plus five more is nine. Element number nine is fluorine. The element contains six electrons in the second energy level. 
Well, we made it as far as beryllium, and so far there's only two electrons there. If we were to write for boron, who is number five, we would get 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, and that only gives me three electrons in the second energy level. Two in the S, one more in the P. Go next door to carbon, number six. Whoops, I meant to write C, number six. And you get 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So there are four electrons in N equal two, two in the S, two more in the P. We need five. We need six, I gotta go two more. Next door to carbon is nitrogen, number seven. One S2, two S2, two P3. And that gives me a total of five electrons in this second energy level. I think finally we'll hit our mark, number eight for oxygen. 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. That adds to eight electrons. Two in the s, four more in the p, gives us six total electrons in the second energy level. n equals two. Two in the s, four more in the p, represents six total electrons in the second energy level giving us the element oxygen for answer letter D. So if we look further at the arrangement of our periodic table and think about how the electrons arrange their, uh, are arranged, you notice a trend, very easy trend, and I find this particular grid extremely helpful in predicting electron configurations. Notice that the period number represents the quantum energy level. So N equals period number. N equal one is period one. N equal two, period two. If I'm going to end in an S sublevel, I end in period, I'm sorry, end in either group 1A or 2A, and that is known as the S block. This particular column, group 1A, will always end in S1. This particular column will always end in S2. This would represent 2S2, 3S2, 4S2, and so forth. Here we have the P block. P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, and then the P's are full with six electrons. This is known as the D block. D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, D7, D8, D9, D10. The D block is full with 10 electrons. And you guessed it, the Fs would have 14 with seven different shapes. So if I pick an element and just see where it resides, I can figure out where it, what kind of configuration it would be. So for instance, let's give the orbital diagram for the element sulfur. Where does sulfur live on the periodic table? And this is kind of your next diagram here. We're gonna give uh, sulfur. Write the electron orbital diagram for sulfur. I'm gonna use this chart to do so. Find sulfur on your periodic table. Do you see how it's number 16? That tells me I have 16 electrons to place. But more importantly, let's find that its period is three, and that its group number, if you look, is in 6A. So, it is period three, one, two, three, and it is one, two, three, four over in the three P block, one, two, three, four. So here is the element sulfur on this periodic table. 
What that tells me is that the last thing I'm going to write in the configuration of an, a sulfur will be 3P4. It's 1, 2, 3 fourth over in the P block, 3P4. 1S2, 2S2, 2P6. Now I'm standing so far at neon. End of the row, go down. 3S2. Go four more over to hit sulfur. 3P4, and we've written for sulfur. That easy. Read the book. Read it like a left to right book, and you've written out the electron configuration. So for this answer for sulfur, you wrote 1S2. 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4. The orbital diagram would show two electrons in the 1s orbital, two more in the 2s orbital, a total of six filling the th uh, 2p orbital, and notice this is the last noble gas you passed through that's the last P6. Who represents 2P6? Let me ask that a different way. Second energy level, who is 2P6? Well, that's neon, isn't it? And when you write for neon, you're writing that in a noble gas configuration, and you could simply pick up 3S2, 3P4. That's the shortcut, isn't it? The last four electrons, each one spinning up and the last one spinning down. You have two unpaired electrons. Try again. This time magnesium, aluminum, bromine. Magnesium, aluminum, and bromine. So again, let's take some practice. Find magnesium on the periodic table. When we look at magnesium, magnesium is period three, group 2A. Period three, group 2A is right here. This is the element magnesium. So I know that the S1, S2, the last thing I'll write is three S2 when I write for magnesium. So when I write out its configuration, I read the book as left to right. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, done, I've reached for magnesium. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, that's the electron configuration for the element magnesium. The orbital diagram really just looking at what we refer to as core electrons, which are really the last noble gas you passed through, which in this case would be the element neon, number 10. Adding the superscripts gets me to number 10. Adding two more electrons in that valence shell, we have 3s2. There's magnesium. Neon, 3s2. Find aluminum. Let's check the chart again, this time for aluminum. Aluminum is period three, and it's in group 3A. Period three, group 3A, this is the little box here representing aluminum. So I start at the top and I just read this like a book. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, I'm not there yet, one more, 3p1. That gets me to the aluminum box on the periodic table when I end at 3p1. We did aluminum, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, go one more over from magnesium to find aluminum, 
3p1. Notice this represents the core electrons. The last noble gas you pass through are known as the core electrons. This is the element neon. 2 plus 2 plus 6 is 10, so that's neon's configuration. Aluminum has three valence electrons, two in the S sublevel, one more in the P sublevel. And notice I know that just by where it lives based on identifying the group number. There's one more on this page, bromine, B-R. This is a big one, isn't it? Bromine. Bromine, when you find it on the chart, it's number 35. Let's get rid of this for bromine. Let's find bromine. Bromine is number 35. I see it in period four. And it's in group 7A. So let's just find that. Period 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Group 7A. Do you notice that this is the box now for bromine? So when we write its configuration, we just read this graph from left to right as if you would a book. 1S2. 2S2. 2P6, go to the next row, 3S2, and that row, 3P6. Notice how I'm getting those, how many boxes to pass through, that's six. Then I come down a row and I hit 4S2. I'm not there yet, I got it all the way to bromine. Notice from 4S, I have to go through 3D, and there's 10 boxes here, we said, 10 boxes, 3D, 10. Finally, I'm getting close, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5 in the fourth energy level. 4P5 gets me to bromine. Who's the last noble gas you passed through before hitting bromine? Well, this is helium, this is neon, this is argon, and we did not make it to krypton. So the last noble gas we pass through would be the last P6. That represents argon, 4S2, 3D10, 4P5, everything after that, that uh, argon configuration. The highest energy level we wrote for is quantum number four. There are seven valence electrons, V-A-L-E-N-C-E, -E, valence electrons. Two of them reside in the S, five more reside in the P for a total of seven. We do not include the 3D, three is a smaller number than four for the valence electrons. There's seven valence electrons in the element argon, um, bromine. Sorry, You knew that because its group is 7A. Seven valence electrons. So we wrote that for bromine, but we wrote it on a different page, didn't we? We wrote it here. So I could shorten that up. 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, 4S2, 3D10, 4P5. You got it. Convert these to the noble gas configuration, sodium, silicon, and iodine. All right, now we're going to go a little faster. We're getting the hang of this. Sodium is number 11. Do you see where it lives? Until you get comfortable, pause the video and look it up. Come back when ready. Don't cheat yourself. Find the element. It's in period 3, group 1A. Period 3 tells me I'm going to write 
3 as the last highest energy level. Group 1A is going to tell me how many electrons in the outermost energy level there will be one valence electron. The last thing I write will be 3s1, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. That's 11 valence electrons, but we were asked to write it for the noble gas configuration. Looking at where sodium lives, which is right here, sodium, who's the last noble gas you pass through? Well, you can see that was neon, representing number 10. So the first 10 electrons are neon. My configuration would place neon in a bracket, 3s1. The next one we have is silicon, si. Silicon is number 14. Now find it on the periodic table. It is also in period three, the last highest quantum number I write is n equal three, and it's found in group 4a. So I know there will be four valence electrons, four electrons in the outermost energy level. That's why it lives where it lives. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p, two gives me 14 electrons. The last noble gas you pass through represents the core electrons. That represents the element neon. Valence electrons, there's four of them as we predicted by its group number. Two of those relied in the S sublevel Two more lie in the P sublevel for a total of four valence electrons. And the last one is iodine on this page. This is a larger atom as well. Iodine is number 53. That means we have to start at the top and write for iodine. Let's take a shortcut right off the bat. We're getting so comfortable with this particular grid and how useful it is. Iodine is our target. All right, iodine we said was number 53. Now let's keep in mind where that is. Iodine lives in period one, two, three, four. It's five rows down. And it's in group 7A. So iodine lives right here. The noble gases, top one is helium. Next one is neon, then we have argon, then we have krypton, K-R, and then we have xenon, and if we kept going, you'd see radon. Who is the last noble gas we pass before we get to iodine? Well, that's krypton, isn't it? So right off the bat, I know I can save myself all of the time for writing out the first 36 electrons, because this is number 36 on the periodic table. And after this row is full, we come down here, don't we? After row four is full, we hit row five, and we fill the 5s2. From 5s2, we hit the 4d block. I'm running out of room, so I'll put it under. And from 4D, we go back to 5P, and we have one, two, three, four, five left before we land at iodine. So the shorthand method for iodine is placing chrome, um, krypton in a bracket, KR, picking up with the fifth row, 5S2, then we pass through 4D10, 10, 10 blocks there to pass through all of those Ds, Right, D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now we've completed the D block, and we go back to P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, and we've arrived at iodine. Much repetition is making this easier. 
And I have, you know, just this, the students in response saying, you know, after enough practices, this becomes redundant enough to become simple. So I encourage you to keep practicing. And I've been kind of filling out what I call valence electrons, and I'll just go ahead and catch up that vocabulary word to what we've been saying. The valence electrons are those electrons in the outermost energy level, and we know that's from the group number it lives in. Group A elements represent their valence electrons. Any element in the same chemical family, group 1A, group 2A, have those same chemical properties. And it's because they have the same number of electrons in the valent shell. That valent shell is the outermost shell, the highest value of n, the integer that represents the principal energy level. Those electrons that we find in the valent shell are called valence electrons. So for example, with beryllium, the highest energy level we wrote was energy level two. In the S sublevel, there's two electrons. There are two valence electrons in the S sublevel. The valence shell for chlorine has two sublevels, an S and a P. In the valence shell that is the third energy level, there's two valence electrons in an S plus five more in the P, giving us a total of seven valence electrons. Tie that to the periodic table. Beryllium lives in group 2A. You automatically know it has two valence electrons. That's why it lives where it lives. We also know that it's in period two, so you automatically know that the valence shell of highest energy is two. That's why it lives where it lives. You know that chlorine lives in group 7A, so you know it will have seven valence electrons. That's why it lives where it lives. And it has period three. So you automatically know the valence shell, the one of highest energy, will be n equal three. So there is a tie to the location of the elements on the periodic table to find that information quickly. Elements in the same group number have similar configurations, and that's because the same groups have the same number of valence electrons. Group 1A to group 8A match the valence electrons to the group they live in. Remember, the only exception to that would be the noble gas helium. Helium lives in group 8A, but it only has two electrons. So I'm going to make that note for us here. So hydrogen helium, row one, has only two electrons in that first sublevel, 1s2, then that row is full and you go down to energy level two. So everyone in the same column, the same group number, the same family, all will share similar chemical properties because they all have the same number of electrons in the outermost energy level. The noble gas notation, as it looks like here, is just kind of helping us see that trend. So this slide is just emphasizing, as you look at lithium, who lives here, underneath it lives sodium, underneath that lives potassium, then rubidium, then cesium. Notice that period number matches the highest energy level. Period one, two, three, four, five, six, period seven would be down here. So I automatically know the highest energy level, what's written in red by the period it's represented in. And I know the last superscript you write for the electron configuration will be a one because it lives in group 1A on the periodic table. 2s1 for lithium, 3s1 for sodium, 4s1 for potassium, and so forth through the road.
So this is just relating electrons to the group number. It's quite simple. Period one, we have hydrogen and helium, 1s1, 2s1. In period two, 2s1, 2s2. Here is the configuration from boron, representing three valence electrons. Here's the configuration of carbon, representing four valence electrons, and so forth. So I think we've had a really good opportunity to practice recognizing how many valence electrons just matching the group number that you find it living in. How many valence electrons, and give the name of the element, how many valence electrons, and then identify the name of the element. I'm gonna look through this list and I'm gonna find the highest energy level and find all of the numbers that it is found in. I found the number three and it's written twice. So here I can see the highest energy level is three. That tells me the period number is three. Then I can count how many electrons in the highest energy level and two plus two is four. Like that. So n equal three, four valence electrons. How many valence electrons? Well, there's four. Who lives in period three, group four A? Period three, group four A is silicon. Now, one other way we can check that, you know, silicon is number 14. So you have one, two, three, four. Four plus six is 10. 10 and four gives you the total number of electrons of 14. I'm gonna try one more. The highest energy level found. <clears throat> Let's see, this is a long one. What's the biggest number you see in this whole thing? right here, isn't it? The highest quantum number we wrote, the energy level of highest energy comes from six. That tells me you're in the sixth period. How many valence electrons do you see written in N equals six? I only see the number six written once in that whole thing. And there's two electrons. In the S sublevel, in the sixth principal energy level, there are two electrons. Now remember, that tells you the group number, doesn't it? So <clears throat> who lives in the sixth period in the second column is the element barium. B-A is its elemental symbol. It's number 56. Should we count to be sure we have the right one? One, two, three, four. Four plus six is 10, 12, 18, 20, 30, 36, 38, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56. Uh-oh. There's something after this, isn't there? That takes us to barium. So I'm glad we checked. Because you know what? From barium, we add 24 more electrons. Let's see where that takes us. 56 plus 14, plus 10 more, gets us to element 70 by the time I'm done adding all of the numbers up. So who's number 70 on the periodic table? That's down in that last column, down in there. Number 70 is an element with the symbol YB. I don't even know how to say its name. 70 valence electrons.
Okay, I paused the video because I ran into a problem and I recognized it. And it's a simple math mistake. Oh my gosh, I must need to break after this. When I add 10, I carry a 1, don't I? That gets 70 plus 1 more is 8. It's number 80. That makes so much more sense to me. It's in the 5D block. That's mercury. Number 80 is the element mercury. Mercury still has two valence electrons. The highest number we found was n equals 6. In the second energy level, the highest occupied energy level is still the highest number you write for n, and that is 6. There are two electrons in the outermost energy level in the s sublevel, so two valence electrons. But to get the identity of the element, I add all of the electrons together, and when I add properly, 10 plus 10 and 18, 18, 24. I paused the video and re-added, found my adding mistake. I don't get 7, I get 80. Not an element I never heard of, Y, B, but rather 80 is mercury. And now we've properly identified and give the name of the element as mercury. Let's try some more and we'll wrap this lesson up using electron configurations. And then I'll pause and come back and give the rest. Let me pause here, just take a little break, and then come back to me when ready. I'll start up a next new video, practicing again electron configurations, identifying elements. We have just a quick wrap up with uh, dot structures and periodic trends.